Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I want to welcome you again to uh, our Transplant Institute lecture series. Uh, today, we are very fortunate to uh, extend uh, our string of having amazing speakers visit with us and share with us their innovation and their expertise. Uh, we have Dr. Giuliano Testa uh, coming from Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas, where he is the chief of abdominal transplantation for the uh, Simmons Transplant Institute. And this is my alma mater where I did my transplantating as well. Uh, Dr. Testa has had a, a very rich background he's, uh, in education. He studied his Italian, as you will tell. He studied at the University of Padova, uh, where he did his medical school and surgical residency. And then he came to the United States, where he did also general surgery training at the University of Chicago. And then went on to do a transplantation at Baylor. And he is a lifelong learner. When we went back to Chicago, he got a master's degree in business administration uh, from the University of Chicago and also a fellowship in uh, medical ethics, uh, where he also participated in the ethics activity as a surgical director for clinical ethics. And uh, he did quite an early interest in living donor and liver transplantation. And he's recognized as an international authority on the subject starting from the early 90s when he went back to Essen on faculty and started the adult to adult living donor liver transplant program. And subsequently came back to the United States and held positions at the University of Chicago, University of Illinois. And since 2011 has been at Berry University where he was recruited to uh, basically start and expand the living donor adult to adult program which has been very successful under his leadership. And he has been the chief of transplant. And in addition to those interests, he acquired a new interest in uterus transplantation. And nationally and internationally, he's viewed as an innovator uh, who spearheads unique ideas. And in addition to that, he's got humanitarian thoughts on the subject. His recognition was noticed by many. Uh, I think in Chicago, he even got a class act award. I never knew such a thing existed, but I would, I would support that. Uh, you, Giuliano is indeed a class act in our transplant community, serves on many committees of the ASTS and UNOS. And, and more interestingly, last year in 2018, he was on Time Magazine's Time 100, voted the top, one of the top 100 most influential men in the world. And that tells you about his unique interests that span beyond the scope of what we do here in transplantation. And without much ado, I would love to introduce Dr. Giuliano Testa. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is a, a distinct pleasure for several reasons. Uh, you got to the, to the age when uh, you get invited to give talks, but there are really talks that you prepare with a certain uh, uh, feeling. And uh, this is really the feeling I share with, uh, uh, with Marwan. Um, it was where I trained in, in transplant, and uh, it's always been to me, for me an example of how to set up a program, how to grow it. We've been talking a lot about this in, in these few hours we have had together. And uh, so for me, it's a, a true honor to be here and, uh, and a pleasure, because despite I'm not used to this weather any longer, it's, uh, and I know everybody's been talking about that. But reality is that it's, it's, uh, I feel very warm, uh, very well welcome, and treated like a king. So I'm, I'm very happy, and I thank you all and Mara for doing this for me. Uh, and by the way, the introduction is way too kind. I, I just uh, happen to be a, 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 a transplant surgeon, and uh, I share also with, with ATSI the residency program, because ATSI and I uh, spent some years at the University of Chicago. And, um, but a surgeon overall. And uh, this new interest that came uh, by chance, and now has grown in something that has really caught my, uh, my passion and my, my drive for making things uh, better for, I hope, some people. The, the uniqueness of this transplant is that really the only thing you really want to achieve doing it is giving a baby to a, a woman that otherwise would not have that chance. That's all. It's not done for the benefit of the patient at all. The only goal, the only true goal is having a baby. The uniqueness is also the fact that uh, the difference with all the transplants we do, we treat very, very severely ill patients. Here you, you don't treat anybody who's ill. 
you, you treat somebody who's absolutely healthy and you give a chance. And then once you're done, you don't have to have headaches about long-term survival or kidney function. Uh, when things go well, it's really in front of your eyes. It's really a warming uh, and a great feeling for people like us who unfortunately have to deal every day with very, very sick patients. Uh, this is what we're trying to do. We go from uh, embryo to uh, little kiddos. And uh, the other thing we're trying to do is to fill the vacuum because there is a hole where a uterus is supposed to be in all these uh, beautiful women. Our aim is to put the uterus where it's missing. Um, who, is the, who benefits from this procedure? At the end of the day, uh, any uh, woman who's affected by the one that's called absolute uterine infertility, which in few words means the only thing missing is the uterus, or even if the uterus is there, it's not working. That's all. And this is really the indication for the procedure. Um, what are the possibilities in this case? Well, you can adopt. Uh, you can, uh, in some states in the United States, uh, you can uh, do surrogacy. Or you can even choose not to have a kid. But if neither or no, or no, no of this uh, option is there, then uterus transplant comes to help this, uh, this woman. Um, one of the questions that people ask all the time is, yeah, you are doing this, but this is very esoteric. Uh, how many people will really benefit from it? And that was a surprise to all of us. First of all, for me as a transplant surgeon, I have very little OBGYN background. What is the real need was a total unknown. But then when you start looking into it, it comes down that the need is in the thousands. And this is in the thousands, even if you calculate only 1% of the entire number of women who may have absolute uterine infertility. And uh, it's, uh, there are some conservative numbers and some more aggressive numbers, but the bottom line, if you compare the potential of this transplant and you compare to the one that we do nowadays, you end up having potentially as many recipients as you have for the number one transplant we do in this country. So it's not a small uh, talk. And by the end of this talk, I hope I can give you an idea why it might happen this way, or also why it may happen in a different way in terms of not being as successful I hope this is going to be. Uh, but the good part is there is also a position of the American Society of Reproductive Medicine that has embraced uterus transplantation as one of the means to allow women who otherwise could not uh, to have children. This is a fairly unique transplant and has some really very intriguing points. Number one, as you may understand, this is a life-saving. I'm not even sure that it's a, it's a life-enhancing uh, transplant because for the woman who receives the transplant, uh, it's a long journey, it's not an easy one. So at the end of the day, it's a total different transplant in its category. It's temporary. The only other transplant, temporary transplant that you may think in our world is uh, the auxiliary transplant we used to do for acute liver failure, and then you would wait for the liver to regenerate the original, the native liver, and let the other one disappear. In this case, this is a true temporary. You place it, you have the pregnancy, and then you take it out. So it's a, it's a very uh, special category. For being a, a, a transplant, it can be done with disease or living donor, and a touch basis later on where we think this might go. And interesting enough is a stepwise success because you have different steps prior to say that you can, uh, you have been successful in performing this. And of course, the interesting part is if you're a living donor for a uterus transplant, you're giving up a, let's call it an organ that has exhausted its function in the woman who donates while it's still perfectly useful for somebody who receives that, which is not the same thing for a kidney living donor or for a living uh, liver donor. And then there are several parties involved. There is a, a donor, there is a mother, there is a child, and there is also a husband. This is a, a family kind of thing. You do it to enhance the life of a, uh, of a family. I said this is a stepwise success, and that's why it is. Usually when we do a liver transplant or a kidney transplant, we await for the clamps to come out. We see the organs picking up in color. If it's a kidney, we hope it's making urine. If it's a liver, it's supposed to make bile. And then you go home, and you wait for the patient to recover and go home. In this case, you do the transplant. You wait until uh, the uterus pinks up, and then that's it. 
then you have to wait until you have the first period as a sign that that organ is actually being perfused and responding to the hormones. Then you have to stabilize the immunosuppression. Then you have to implant the fertilized egg. Then you go through the pregnancy and finally you deliver the baby. So for a transplant surgeon like some of the audience, you know how stressful this is? It's killing me because it, it takes forever to see really the, 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 the aim uh, concluded and, and the kid uh, alive. So it's, it's a long process. Historically, interestingly enough, and if you, tonight if the weather is bad, you can rent this movie. This is The Danish Girl. This is a phenomenal movie. The actor is just fantastic. But it's the true story of the first uterus transplant that has been recorded in human history. And it, was, it happened in a transgender person that was actually not German, but the operation was performed in Germany, in Dresden. And uh, then, of course, uh, of course, unfortunately, the recipient uh, died. There was no immunosuppression at the time. That's 1933. And uh, the, the surgical act of this uh, operation, unfortunately, got destroyed during uh, World War II. But we know that this happened, and the movie uh, tells the story. It's a beautiful, really moving movie. But after this, there were some uh, uh, animal experiments until in Saudi Arabia, there was the first performed. And uh, that didn't last that long. It lasted only a few weeks, and that to be taken out probably because it was not well perfused. Then finally, in Turkey, it is the first disease uh, uh, transplant, uterus transplant, that is still in the woman today that has not been able to conceive uh, as there's several miscarriages and some in the community thinks it's about time to take it out because it's not really working, but that has been the first one performed. And then finally, you find somebody, uh, Professor Brandstrom from uh, Gothenburg in Sweden, who really dedicates his life. He's an OBGYN oncologist and was struck one time by, this is the, the story that he told us, by one of his patients, a very, very young patient, who said, had a hysterectomy at a young age, in gestational age, and said, I'm not going to have kids. And this is, this is destroying me. Can't you just give me another uterus? And he started thinking in those terms, and finally he did the right you know, logical way of doing it. Went into uh, small animal models, then he went to primates, and finally they started the first worldwide, uh, the world first program for uterus transplant. It was successful, and so they could announce that that was uh, the case. So those are the things I told you, uh, and uh, this is the first successful uterus transplant. The beautiful part about this, and for me, it's unfortunately, it's, it's a bad nemesis, is that the, the first birth is from a uterus is 61 year of age. So the woman who donated was menopausal. They gave her hormones. They made sure that the uterus was still responding to the hormones. They did the hysterectomy, they transplanted, and then the baby was born. So that tells you a lot about what nature can do and how sometimes we got nothing really. The nature is so fascinating. But this is the true story, and that's the first kid. Those are um, pictures that I got from uh, Lisa Johannesson, who was number two in Gothenburg and now works with us and is uh, my partner in crime in doing these things. Uh, their success is, is very evident, is great. They did nine transplants, only two failed almost right away for technical reason. One was taken out after several attempts of uh, pregnancy uh, because of chronic infection, but the other six they all deliver, and two of them deliver twice. So this tells you that if you know something about the IVF, that tells you that with this procedure, when you do it right, and we have good embryos, you really have a very high chance of success. And this is great. And now this is the first series in Gothenburg. Now they're doing the second series. I think they've done already five or six. So they are progressing in uh, achieving more knowledge about this. In the world, not much out there for the time being, but things are moving fast. You heard all, I think, about the first disease donor uterus transplant birth that occurred in Brazil. And then there is a, a new one now in China. Uh, it was published about uh, two weeks ago. Interestingly enough, that hysterectomy was done with the robot, so it's the first successful of the robotic hysterectomy in a living donor. 
There are two in India that were born with a laparoscopic hysterectomy. Then there is our case uh, that was the second in the world, and, uh, and then the, now there are new center, centers in, in Germany and the United States. So we are going to hear more about this uh, incredible experience of uterus transplantation. Um, the way it started by us, uh, very, very simple. I heard the talk about the ethics of uterus transplant. I knew nothing about that. I went back to my hospital, started thinking about that. I proposed this to the leadership. Leadership was crazy enough or drunk, I don't know. They gave me the money. Uh, the Ethic Commission passed it, the Medical Board passed it, the RB passed it, and then we got the uh, good friends. And the, in, in your, you want to have good friends in your community, so Mikhail Olofsson and Lisa Johannesson came to Dallas for 10 days. We did four transplants in 10 days, and they started all over there. And now we, are, we have really have an active program. Uh, interesting enough, how you let people know that you're doing something that nobody knows about? Well, we went on the newspaper. That's the only thing we knew about. So we went to the Dallas Morning News, and they gave us the front page. So there is an article that says, Baylor to start uterus transplant. And then we waited. Interestingly enough, in the span of two weeks, we got so many requests that we didn't know what to do with it. Requests that came not only from the recipients, potential recipients, but also from donors. And this was the most touching thing. And this is, in my opinion, the number one strength of this procedure women because it's driven completely by a desire which is a very natural desire for most of us to have a family so this is where i put all my money in the strength of the women who are driving this it's not us but bottom line is that we had the 80 women who stepped forward and said i want to donate my uterus and when you ask them why you want to do that you're going to do through surgery for what the response was unanimous i had a chance they said to have a family I want somebody else to have the same chance. So this has been the first innuendo you're going to have from me of how emotionally charging this procedure can be when you touch such basic, natural things in our life, which is having a family, having babies. So from this, all this, we got uh, 10 recipients. We did the, the, the seven living donors, and we did uh, actually were eight living donors and two disease donors. Now, what do you do when they come? Well, they have to go through some form of the donor, the potential to go through some form of evaluation. And we started off looking, okay, what are the elements? You need to know what the vessels look like. You need to exclude pathology in the uterus. You make sure that the uterus is working. So we did the first CT angels to look at the arteries and we learned a lot about the, the which is a talk on its own, how, how much we learn from the, uh, looking at the arteries. Then we look at the vein, and we found out that the CT was not the best thing to look at the uterine vein. So we went to the MRI, which looks uh, a little better in, in uh, visualizing the vessels that you need. And then, of course, uh, um, you, uh, you have to do the surgery. For the time being, we're still doing open surgery, so we're doing a laparotomy. Uh, but I think we're going to transition fairly soon to a less invasive way of doing it. And I probably would dare to say that that will see even a, an increase in the number of women who would like to donate their uterus because now they can do that in a laparoscopic or minimally invasive fashion. Um, but the bottom line is that you, the uterus is uh, gifted with at least four venous outflows, which is good because very often not all of four of them can be used. And two are based on the uterovarian segment and two are the uterine veins. Uh, the uterovarian segments drain in the ovarian veins, so they go all the way up north. The uterine veins go into the iliac veins. And then it has two inflows with the arteries that they come from the internal iliac artery. So the goal of the surgeon is to procure this organ having the arteries intact and the veins intact and then choose on the back table which one are the best options. And the good part, you can see there, uh, this is the pointer, yeah. The good part is that the, the, is a very thin uh, and very small vessel, but if you can get a little patch on it, it becomes a little easier to uh, um, do the anastomosis. The artery comes with a segment of the internal leakal artery, so it's a little bigger and allows you a little bit of relaxation while you do the anastomosis. Um, the implantation is a, what I call a modified kidney transplant, meaning that the vessels of inflow and outflow are the same one we use for the kidney transplant, only that it's done bilaterally, right and left. You, you want to have all inflows and all outflows possible. And then the vault of the vagina of the recipient is uh, sewn in to the rim of the vagina coming from the donor. So it's a five, at least five anastomosis operation. 
Um, and this is a, the, the hole that you saw before in the other picture that needs to be filled with the, with the uterus. Um, tricks that we learn because of the position, we learn how to put the clamps on the vessels so that the anastomosis uh, comes in a natural fashion, in a downward fashion. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, we learn that the vein wall is extremely thin and breaks very easily. So we start using uh, very thin sutures. So we do the vein with an 8 o proline running, and we do the artery with a 7 o proline running. The uh, vaginal anastomosis, I don't do it. Uh, for a transplant surgeon, that's a stab in the heart because the OBGYN use, use very big sutures. We're not used to that thing. So I, I leave the room. I don't, I don't want to see that. But <laughs> it, it works. Trust me. It, it, they, they do a very good job. Um, this is the final product. It's pretty cool. Uh, this is down uh, in the vagina stomosis. Those are the round ligaments. They're still attached on the side. Uh, this is the vein. That's the other vein and the, and the other part. This is the, the team that... Uh, did the first uh, place. You, you have Elisa Johannesson here. Uh, Tiffany unfortunately left us. She went to work with the organ bank. That's the only FTE in the entire program. So all we've done, we've done pro bono. We're not getting paid for doing it. If I'd known, I probably would have said no because I, this is a second job to do this thing. But it's been so exciting that I, I still withstand it. And then Colin Kuhn is our uh, partner in crime from the OBGYN department. He does oncology GYN. Bob Gamby is the uh, maternal uh, um, medicine guy. And Greg McKenna is the, my partner in the transplant. And this is, as, as I say, Lisa Johannesson. So that's, that's practically the, the nucleus of, of this brain, to which I added two more transplant surgeons and, uh, and another, uh, the new chief of uh, OBGYN that join us. What you want to see after the transplant, there is flow into the parenchyma of the uterus, like in this case, and then you check the arterial flow as usual. And once you see this, you're really in a, in a good shape. This is a monitoring that is done at day five, uh, well, day one and day five, and then usually we don't repeat it unless there is some change. But we do biopsies, and we do biopsies because that's the only way to assess whether there is a rejection or not for the time being. Maybe later we'll find out some whatever marker, but for the time we don't have it. And so every two weeks uh, we do biopsies. The good part is they don't hurt, and it's really a 10 minutes procedure at the most. And then we read them, and if there is rejection, we treat it, or if there is something wrong, we treat it. But in this case, as you can see, this is a beautifully represented normal biopsy uh, uh, sometime after the transplant. So this is our performance. Um, we've done 14 to date. Uh, I thought we were, sorry, I thought we were out of the woods uh, after these two, and instead that this was a, a, a very bad, I still have to recover for that, it was done in December, and explain you what happened to that. But this is an interesting, this is really, it's easy to be here today and uh, be invited and, uh, you know, you look like, uh, oh, this is the guy who's doing that. I can tell you that if this hadn't worked, I wouldn't be here. Because this is the first four, and we miserably failed the first three. So this is one of those things in life that make you reflect a lot on how things advance. Um, this was the, the one I was hanging with teeth and nails, hoping that it would have worked, and thank God it worked. Because had this not worked, the hospital probably would have told me we're closing the program. No matter whether we had the IRB for 10, but I'm sure that if I didn't have the fourth one, I wouldn't be here talking to you about this. At any rate, why the first three didn't work? Well, it took a lot of uh, humility and understanding. We got uh, the surgeon from Gothenburg who had done more uterus transplant than anybody else in the world at that time to scrub with us in these cases. By his own admission, he said, you know, I didn't see this when I was in Sweden. So the, the problem we had, he hadn't seen it which tells you that when we go around and we play the gorilla in the jungle of the transplant surgeons and know everything after we've done one case, we should just bend our head and go home because it takes a lot to learn a craft as good as to be able then to tell people this is the way I do things. But bottom line is that we had issues. Uh, we had issues mainly with the veins. Two of those three grafts failed because the outflow was poorly constructed. And that's when we did the outflow with 6 proline, And we completely switched off on sutures and we switched position of the vein onto the vein. In terms of the vein comes like this, instead of going up, we end on the side. And that allowed a better outflow. And the other thing that we found out, and we didn't know this, 
I guess that I have some of the friends from transplant here. Nobody would ever transplant a kidney with an artery like this. This is not acute. This is the chronic evidence of that uterus that we transplanted that had a complete atherosclerotic vessels within. We didn't know it. We went with what Sweden has done. They did a 61. This was 53. I said, it's easy. And this lady was premenopausal. So I said, we are fine. We have nearly no issues, and we got burned back time. So we learned this, and, and now, of course, this is all part of a baggage that we hope we can increase uh, day by day. Um, and then we learned another thing, because when I saw the ultrasound that was not really representing a good perfusion in the uterus, I went to my radiologist, Greg DePrisco, who's one of the greatest guys on earth. I said, Greg, what test can I do that shows me whether the uterus is alive or not without having to do an expert apparatum? And because the, the exam under anesthesia was not really something that was really revealing. And he said, well, do an MRI. So this is the first example. <laughs> this is the better of, uh, I'll be remembered as the guy who really screwed up badly. This is the, the first example of an MRI in a human uterus transplant when there is no flow into the uterus. This is when there is flow in the uterus. I mean, the difference is just evident. So we learned a bad way, in few words. Um, but we got lucky. And, uh, and uh, so our first uh, recipient, uh, uh, they had a, a very good uh, post operative course, no issues. Our, I mean, the first successful, so the fourth of the series. And, uh, and then we, we implanted the embryo, first implant, first pregnancy. I said, that's easy. This, this is going to be my life. I'm going to plug the uterus in, give it to the IVF people, and they'll take care of the rest and we'll be fine. But we were very happy, and uh, JJ was born. And this is, uh, this is, he was born at 33 weeks, so fairly early. And the reason why he was so early is because uh, uh, the, recipe, the mom had a creatine that I never liked. Uh, we, he was the, she was the only one where for some reason, and this was uh, uh, my responsibility, we didn't have a GFR prior to. MRKH, which is one of the typical indications for this procedure, very often come with one, not very often, some of them have only one kidney. She had two kidneys, so we said two kidneys, normal working, but probably were not, and she's young, they were not as good working as we think. So under CNIs, under tacrolimus, the creatinine crept up, the worst she had was 1.9, which is not incredible. But that for somebody who's healthy, you don't want to have anybody at that age with a creatinine of 1.9 knowing that it's your fault because you're giving immunosuppression. And so we wanted to, and then I was afraid because in the Swedish experience, three women had either preeclampsia or eclampsia. And so the worst that could happen to me if now my first one has either preeclampsia or eclampsia and something bad happens to her. So I became extremely nervous. I wanted to deliver the baby. And as soon as the OBGYN told me, this is a safe, spot for the baby, she's going to be fine, if she's born, she's going to be in the NICU a little bit, but she will probably need anything from a pulmonary point of view, we deliver it, and he did it fine. And he's growing like crazy, he's just a big boy now. He's a year and uh, three months old. And our second one instead was a st same thing, transplant, implant, first success, pregnancy, delivery, home. Beautiful. So I said, this is going to be my life. It's, a, it's not really the thing that happened. I'll tell you why uh, later on. But what we learned during this thing, we, I think we did give two contributions that I think in a certain way may be important. One is we use uterovarian segment for the outflow. What that means is, is, is the fact that we didn't use the uterine vein. They were too thin and too bad, and we rely only on that uterine and virus segment for the uterus, not only to survive, but we demonstrated they can have pregnancy only with those segments. And then in doing this, we also showed that you can save the ovaries in premenopausal women using only that segment of the vein, which is huge, because it means that you can have a premenopausal woman, 35 year old, has already have three kids, doesn't want anymore, she wants to donate, and you can take the uterus without making them menopausal because of the surgery, which is a huge thing. The other thing is that by taking only the uterovarian segment, you achieve a much easier operation that can be performed much easier laparoscopically or with the robo, because going to fetch the uterine vein is much deeper and difficult operative field than taking the one on top in front of your eyes with the uterovarian segment. So that's the little contribution that we give. And the beautiful part of it is that this is right after the um, implant, 
This is during pregnancy. Look at the flow. It's amazing. You do these things with, micro, with, with loops, a 4.5 magnification, a 8 o proline, and when they get pregnant, the vessel is this big. It's amazing what happens. I mean, I was, of course, you know, for somebody who does this, of course the uterus grows. But to expect that you put in this thing, which is almost microscopic, and then grows to that level, is just phenomenal. And the other thing that we did is that the uterus transplant program in Sweden, they waited one year prior to implantation of the embryo. And we always ask, ask yourself logical question, why you want to wait one year? And the answer was that because in the transplant population, if you transplant somebody with a kidney or a liver, you wait a year before you allow them to be pregnant. So they transpose the same concept to uterus transplant. I said, this makes no sense. These women are absolutely healthy. They have no kidney, they have no diabetes, they have no hypertension, they are healthy. Why are we waiting them and putting them under immunosuppression for such a long time? And so we decided to implant much earlier. So uh, the first one was implanted at seven months, the other one even earlier than that, and she did absolutely fine. Um, so now we have, uh, for the time being, we have uh, two um, babies. Uh, this uh, lady uh, wants to have another one. This was the first successful disease uterus transplant in the United States, and I was going to be, oh no, she was going to be our pride because uh, she got pregnant, but then she has a miscarriage of uh, eight weeks, and that killed me. And so we are still struggling with that. And that has been really the struggle. The struggle has been doing this successful transplant and then being able to implant the embryo and make sure the embryo grows. So it's not as immediate as I want it to be. I mean, Lisa, my partner in crime, tell me, Giuliano, be careful, be, be, it's gonna be fine. We're gonna get there. But for me, every time they fail embryo transfer, it's a stab in the heart because you put so much effort to make this happen. And just because of that little pipette that doesn't do what it's supposed to do, you just get really, really uh, upset about that. Rejection reality has not been a big deal. I mean, everybody was thinking, okay, healthy woman, complete healthy immunosystem, of course they're going to reject. Reality is we have seen very little of it and without using really that much of immunosuppression either. Uh, not to mention the fact that in pregnancy, the women tend to be a little bit immunodepressed naturally, so we calm down immunosuppression during the time as well, and this has worked well for us uh, through this time. Uh, uh, I'm sorry for the, this. Is, this is not the right headline. I couldn't change it because this is a, a slide that Greg used and he used the Mac. I used the other system and <laughs> you, guys, you can do things. But anyhow, this is the classification, this is the classification of uh, uh, ACR according to the uh, Gothenburg experience. We are completely changing this. We have 150 specimens, and we are completely rewriting this because this is not really what happens. And especially for the one that they call the, the grade one or borderline, we have seen a lot of things that don't reflect the real rejection. So uh, we are going to have a lot of data that are going to be very helpful because in, in Gothenburg, they treated uh, many uh, of this borderline with steroids. And I think it's unnecessary. You don't want to give extra medication uh, to this woman unless they really need it. So what we learn? Donor age, you know, if I look at my uh, nemesis in, in Sweden, they have been very successful with older donor, I have not. And so I, I don't know what to say. For the time being, I'm restricting the age because I want to avoid that variable, that noise that I don't want to have. Uh, the MRI has added a lot to our evaluation of the living donor. And then we modified the IRB because we found out that the only time you really can decide whether the uterus can be used is once you have it out and you can evaluate the vessels. So in the beginning, we brought the patients in the room and then you feel kind of that the recipient, you feel kind of forced to use a uterus that probably would not. So I decided to change the uterus. We tell the donor and the recipient, the operation will occur in the recipient only when the uterus is there and we have the right to discard the uterus if we don't think that is going to work. Because there is nothing worse you can do to give the false hope of doing a transplant to somebody and then the day after going into the room and telling them, I'm sorry, we have to take it out because he's dead. It's really an awful moment for anybody's perspective. The back table is very important because you need to really be sure that you're selecting and uh, handling the vessels very well. 
At the end of the day, the one that everybody was focusing on was the inflow, but the arterial anastomosis is not a big deal. And the vein anastomosis needs to be done very carefully. We use now anticoagulation because the blood flow within the uterus is very sluggish. It drives you insane. And so before this, the uterus reperfuses, it takes a while, you need to just go out and drink a coffee and then come back. But anyhow, anticoagulation helps. And then, of course, the, the, the Doppler is what uh, we place actually a Cook Doppler probe on the artery. So we have a continuous signal for the first five days. It's the same one that we use on living donor liver transplant. That gives a, a peace of mind to everybody on the team. Um, there was a question from the Gothenburg experience. The donor operation in Gothenburg's average time, no average time, the, the least amount of time that in the OR is 11 hours. That was a scare for everybody. Our time is five hours in the OR. So I think that's not an issue. Uh, the length of the vessels is not an issue, so we, we sorted it out. The donor recovery, once you learn the few oops, uh, it, it becomes a fairly straightforward operation. And um, the good part is even if you have a negative outcome, the recovery from that is fairly, fairly easy. The bad part is that you can have a, a dead uterus and without increasing Y count, with no tachycardia, no fever which scares you because uh, you need really to more. And I think that's what happened to the first case in, in Saudi Arabia. They had it for a long time, but just because they didn't recognize that the uterus was actually uh, not well perfused. I want to take a, a little time, uh, and then I hope I have a time for your question, if you have some, I hope so, about ethics of, uh, of this. Um, before this became successful, there was a lot of criticism because there were rumors uh, that people were starting to do uterus transplantation. And um, uh, the, we, people were skeptical because how can you propose something where you don't know whether it's going to work? And Arthur Kaplan, who is a very famous bioethicist in the United States, uh, wrote a paper that said the, the equipoise of uh, uterus transplant doesn't exist because you don't have a successful procedure. Now the procedure has been successful and the ethics of it, of course, have evolved. And interesting enough, when somebody, somebody is successful, everybody likes to write about it. But the funny part, this is my biggest criticism as a transplant surgeon who does some ethics, is that most of the people who write ethics about medicine are not doctors. And so and they say, let, let us say something, since we are in the trenches every day. So that happens in uterus transplantation uh, as well. But there has been a change in the way we intend the transplantation. We have gone from the famous life-saving procedures to somewhat life-enhancing or, or ameliorating procedure uh, or prolonging procedure. And now we have this new wave, and I think uterus fits very well in it because I consider this to be a life-normalizing procedure. Not only because it restores anatomy normality where there is no normality because the uterus is not there anymore, but also because it gives normality to or normalcy to the families because they can have a, a pregnancy and the delivery is as anybody else. Um, we wrote a paper about what's a clinical equipoise. Very simply, every new drug that comes to the market needs to be as good or the same of the one that was there prior. So if the new kid in the block is uterus transplant, the question to be asked is, is uterus transplant as good as what's there before? So the only other alternative to uterus transplantation that gives the possibility to a father and a mother to give their genetic material is surrogacy. So the alternative is surrogacy. So we did an analysis from an ethical point of view whether a uterus transplant would withstand the confrontation with surrogacy. I think we, that wins pretty good, the, 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 the competition, let's say, and, uh, and we published this in American Journal of Transplantation. Um, but then, of course, the, the criticism are still there and you have to address them. So what are the potential risks for the donor? Well, that's the same question you would ask, what are the potential risks for a living donor liver or for a living donor kidney? The risks are there. Depends where we as a society are willing to accept the risks and which limit we put to the risk. The good part is that about this procedure we know a lot because there are so many steroids performed in this country that you can tell your donor enough data that they can make an informed consent about the decision to donate or not. And this operation kind of fits in between a very aggressive radical hysterectomy for a bad cancer and a simple hysterectomy for fibromas. So we are kind of in the middle. So we can give good information to our donors. The other thing is that, and that's I think is the most intriguing part of it, is that while when you transplant somebody for a liver or a kidney from a living donor, well, 
that's still a functioning organ. In this case, as I said in the beginning, this is an organ that has exhausted the function in the person who donates. And I don't know whether this, from an ethical point of view, gives this a little pass in comparison to other living donations that we do. What are the risks for the mother? Well, there are risks for the mother. Those are women that would not ever go to surgery unless it was for this procedure. So you have to understand they have to go through the IVF, number one. That's now a riskless, complete riskless procedure. Then they have to have a, the implantation of the graft. Then they have to have immunosuppression with all the side effects of immunosuppression. Then there is the C-section delivery, and then you have to remove the graft. So there is a lot they have to go through, and there are some risks with that. So how do we mitigate that? At the end of the day, I think that the only way that you can mitigate is to make sure that you select your donors proper, your recipient properly, and make sure you give the most informed consent you can. Because they need to understand, of course, that there are alternatives, and they need to be on board with that. My experience has been that the ones who are on board with that, they are completely on board. My heart goes back to the first three that we did, both donor and recipient. They went home empty and they didn't get what they wanted, a child. And I always would respect them, but none of them came back to us and said, hey, you gave us false hopes, what did you do, or stuff like that. Because I think we did a very good job in making sure that they knew what they were getting. They knew this is experimental. They knew we are still learning. So I think this is very important and very important, especially for me as a surgeon and for the team you work with. Full disclosure about things is essential. The risk for the child, we have data from thousands of children. They are born from mothers who had received a, a solid organ transplant. So it's not like we have no data on children who are born when the mother was taking immunosuppression. So we know what happens, but the, the most important part for me is that, of course, you have a, a greater incidence of uh, preterm deliveries and uh, small for size or low, low birth weight in children who are born from mothers who have had a solid organ transplant. But those mothers, not for their fault, are not healthy. Those are mothers who may have already diabetes, hypertension, you name it. These ones are absolutely 100% normal. They're healthy. And so what happens is that some of these risks for the child are mitigated no matter what, just because the environment where they're born is completely healthy. Of course, the seen in Sweden, as I said, some risk of uh, preeclampsia. There is some low birth weight, but interesting, they are at the same weight for age of gestation. So there is not really low birth weight in the, in the true sense of meaning, meaning that they are born at the weight of their age of gestation, which is important. Um, what is going to happen in the future if you ask yourself whether this is going to be a living donor procedure or a disease donor procedure? At the end of the day, in the past I used to think that we will do living donors only if we have enough, we have a, a, a scarcity of supply from the uh, disease world. Reality is that I start to change my mind because I've seen so many women stepping forward that they really want to donate. And uh, what I'm going to say to a sister who wants to donate to her sister, oh, no, don't do that because we have a disease donor. Uh, it's not that immediate. There are certain things you have to respect also for the desire to donate that go beyond the risk that the donor uh, runs. Those are very well and uh, uh, risk. So we'll see what happens. Even if the disease donation in the United States will take uh, place, then the question you have to ask yourself, how are we going to allocate these organs? Because when we allocate livers, we allocate based on disease degree. When we allocate kidneys, most of the time this is the time they've been on the list. But for this, there is no severity in uh, infertility. It's not like somebody is more severely infertile than somebody else. And so it would be very intriguing to see if this thing takes really the position that we think it will in the United States as transplant, then the supply will be an issue and how to allocate these organs will be a, a very interesting um, exercise. I hope we can be uh, involved in this. Uh, the other big thing is the cost. So nobody's paying for it. We have been uh, graciously supported by our institution, but after the next six, the money is gone. And so we will have to present this to the public. I go back to the 1%, why we did all the projections 
in terms of how many women we step forward for this position, we said is only 1%, simply because we believe that only 1% of those women will have the money to pay for it. Because this is a, a costly procedure. Uh, it's not as costly as the Time magazine, for some reason, gave a quote or half a million that I never said. The cost that we have nowadays is about short of 200,000, which is practically, the, in our institution, is what we calculate the cost for a living donor kidney transplant. We are more or less in those uh, realm of money. So it's a lot of money, but it's still a little more affordable than half a million. And I think we have to come up with ways that for which people will be able to pay for it, families will be able to pay for it. And also, I personally feel very involved in trying to have insurance companies or somebody else to step forward and support this as one of the aspects of infertility, which for some reason in this country we give as a discounted thing. Uh, because probably most of us can have kids, so we don't think what well, is the drama for the families who cannot have kids. Or we think, oh, that you, you can adopt. You know, it's, it's nice to talk like this when you have your own family, but when you start to deal, as I've done in the past few years, with families that cannot have a kid, you take a completely different perspective on, this, on these uh, issues. Reality is that infertility, and especially for this reason, is a big thing. There is a beautiful article written by Horlinger where he says uh, they did a study and they look at a woman in gestational age who had an hysterectomy and the hysterectomy for cancer. So they are facing the cancer risk and threat, but then many of them were also as um, distraught by the scenario that they couldn't have kids. So it's a real thing, and it's a thing that you feel every day when you evaluate, like we have been doing the past years, hundreds of women with this problem. So it's not a big thing, it's not a small thing, and I think this is the real benefit of this procedure. The other big criticism has been, uh, well, you're transplanting a uterus, it's got no nerve, and so the woman will not experience pregnancy as a, any normal woman. And this I go back, you know, before you talk, you should really think twice. Because what happens is that we interviewed the two women who deliver in our program, and we did a, a, a very stepwise um, uh, psychological interview, we questioned that really aimed at getting the answer we wanted. This is the quote that struck me the most. The biggest thing is that I feel like I have a stronger bond with my child. Maybe it's superficial. When people see my child, they assume I was pregnant. I don't have to correct them. So this is beautiful if you think about it, because reality is that this goes beyond just doing a transplant. What we are realizing step by step growing in this procedure is that we're also giving the possibility of an experience which as i said for many of us has been normal and natural but for many people is not there and i feel very very happy about this It's something that has given a different perception of the things we do so this is the talk if you have time please come down to dallas uh, on may 3 and 4 we're going to talk about this has been a true Honor, Maron, thank you for inviting me, for making me feel such an important person. And I hope you have some questions. Thank you so much. I think up there, up there. For the time being, the RB that we have is two. We allow two pregnancies. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. We didn't have, so the, no, we didn't. And I think, you know why we don't? I think it's become, the growth is very, 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 very timely. So it occurs over months 
and this time allows the vessel to stretch and there is no, there, there's, can there not be any kinking, there's not been any, any compression. So, no, we didn't have any problem with that. Just one other thing. <coughs> Yeah, at the end of at the end of the trial, they all get an hysterectomy, and uh, we all take them off immunosuppression. Hi, thank you for your talk. Hi. It was uh, excellent. Um, I have a few questions. I'm a hepatologist. Um, what kind of immunosuppression do you typically use for these patients? It's a standard run of the mill. We do a little bit of an induction. I don't know even if it's necessary, but mm -hmm. again, very young healthy, strong. So we give three doses of time up front. Mm -hmm. We do a week of steroids and that's it. And then we do CNI, so tacrolimus. I use actually a long, uh, once a day dose of Wibembarsus mm -hmm. and azathioprine. We started off mimicking the uh, Gotemol protocol with uh, MMF, mm -hmm. only to find out why you wanna switch off MMF at three months because you are uh, afraid of the teratogenic effect. Aza also in FDA comes out with a possible teratogenic, but the, the category is much lower and they're proof that is not teratogenic, so we use Aza from the beginning. Across the pregnancy, yes. Um, and then uh, my other question would be, so I saw that the data you presented show that there was an increase in preeclampsia in some of these patients. Are you using um, aspirin or statin therapies as a kind of prophylaxis for them? They, some of, I've given baby aspirin. Um, reality is I think the best prophylaxis for that is to choose your uh, recipient with two kidneys and normal kidney function to start with. The one they had in Sweden, the three of them, they all had one kidney. So it, I think that you stress the system through immunosuppression in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Our IRB say five years. So if, we, if in five years we don't achieve what we wanted to achieve, we are gonna take the uterus out. Thank you. Oh. Um, just, you know, if uh, in this day and age, if a man who was transitioning to a woman came to you and requested the transplantation, what would be the approach of the team? Um, well, this is, a, this is a loaded question because I've been, uh, I've been under fire for a lot for this. Um, disclaimer, my institution is a Baptist institution. So when I uh, presented the protocol, they asked only two things. One, no eugenics. I was perfectly okay with that. I don't want to modify any embryo. You know, that's what you got. That's your genetic material. The only thing we do is make sure you don't have a trisomy or something that will really at the end, really make your life much harder if you had a, a, an outcome of that kind. And then they ask no transgender. Um, I have a personal evolution on the issue of transgender that has to do with the fact that finally I'm exposed to something I didn't know very well before. Reality is our RB speaks for having ovaries. You need to have your own ovaries because if you don't have, then you you, the moment you transplant ovaries, then you transplant genetic material. So that is an ethically loaded transplant that I'm not willing to undertake. Not having ovaries, you may say, well, you still implant it, and then you play with the hormones to do this. It's never been done, and I'm not the one who's gonna try it. And I, at the same time, I really don't even have the, the perception how, how you have to manipulate these hormones to allow them to have a, a natural, growth in, in the fetus. So I, I think is somebody will do it. I can tell you for a, for, for a fact, it's not gonna be. Thank you. Um, thank you for your talk, it was excellent. I do have a question. How rigorous is your selection criteria for women um, as far as you may think they want a baby, but maybe this is not maybe what you think is best for them or whatever. How, how rigorous, do you ever have candidates that are kind of questionable? like from a psychological or social aspect? It's I like to believe it's very rigorous. Mm -hmm. Part of the team, uh, I didn't show her, is Anne-Marie Warren. She's mm -hmm. a psychologist. She has practically the most important word at the selection committee than anybody else. Because at the end of the day, we need to be sure that this 
beautiful woman understand that it's a long journey. Mm -hmm. It may turn to be a negative result, meaning not in home, mm -hmm. and they need to have a very stable family relationship because we found out that the spouse is extremely important in this emotional roller coaster. I can tell you, none of these women, because the one we have done thus far are all MRKH, have ever had a period before. So the first period is already something that at the age of 25, they're not even used to, to deal with. Mm -hmm. And that's just the, the, the okay. beginning. And then everything. So I think it's about very rigorous. We are not accepting anybody that doesn't sound, uh, it doesn't get the, the green light from the psychologist. All right, thank you. Hi, one of the um, staff transplant nephrologists. Uh, thank you for humbling us with your work. Um, my mentor, Dr. Venkat, always says Henry Ford is about second chances. Your first three field patients, um, when do they qualify for second chances, or are you considering them? Uh, I'm considering not the, the, none of the first three uh, for their choice. So two of them uh, went into surrogacy after that, and one decided she doesn't want to go on. But um, the two of the failures that I had to display here, they are uh, again in the, in the realm for having a retransplant. I don't know, if you, if you look at the IVF literature, of which I became accustomed only lately because I knew nothing about that, uh, more embryos uh, by Gemini or whatever pregnancy you have, greater risk. So I'm not in the game to increase even further the risk of a pregnancy by doing that. Uh, our protocol speaks for one embryo at a time, Swedish protocol, one embryo at a time, everybody else in the new upcoming world of uterus transplant, transplant one embryo. not across, but for the most part, IVF uh, procedures, right. which allowed for a very capitalistic expansion of the IVF business and high cost. Where do you see this going, and how best to influence the payer environment to make it a covered benefit? So where I would like to see, I would like to use a uterus transplant, it's so trendy now as the Trojan horse to infiltrate the enemy field and get people's attention again onto infertility issues at large. So that the insurance pair will feel the pressure about that. The second thing is that I think, as I said, women are the strong. They are the strong ones. If they go behind this, then the pressure will be very strong on insurance payer. Not to mention the fact that the millennial, if you think about the, if somebody who works at Google has infertility treatment. You work at Amazon, you work at uh, Microsoft. So these, uh, these are the new trends. And I think we're going to have that, but we need a lot of support, not only at the clinical point of view, but also the social, political uh, climate. Uh, not necessarily if they had something that is not directly related to the uterus. So we, we rule out anything that has a, a question mark on the, on the um, uterus function itself. So, for example, if somebody had a low birth weight, uh, somebody has a low amniotic fluid. Uh, so all these things are important. And usually those things are known in the, in the potential donor. So we exclude all those. Thank you so much.